Okay. Can everyone see that? Brilliant. Okay, so yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for uh, thanks, Colin and Rob, for inviting us from around to uh, present in today's today's CPD. Um, over the past uh, 12 months in particular, despite everything that's going on around us, the whole topic of net zero carbon has really gained a lot of, a lot of traction and it's not just, uh, just talk. Now uh, we've got, we're seeing a lot of action happening all around us. So, so I get essentially the, today's aim is to go through the lessons we've learned as a, as a practice um, over, over all these years, but particularly the past 12 months to achieve net zero carbon and uh, kind of highlight the concrete implications on, on, on the design um, and, and what we, we as designers are responsible for. So as, as a form of introduction, I'm, I'm David Spiteri. I'm, I'm a design associate uh, with a particular interest in operational carbon. So I'm from, from an engineering background, but I'm joined um, by my colleague um, Mirko, who's, um, who, unlike me, is from an architectural background. Uh, Mirko, do you want to say a couple of words? Yeah, sure. Um, hello, everybody. Um, um, uh, I work in the London office, and uh, I am an architect by background, but uh, I'm specialized uh, in sustainability, and particularly in embodied carbon, life cycle assessment, and uh, circular economy. Thank you. Yes, well, thanks, Mirko. Of course, uh, uh, thanks very much for the invite, uh, Rob. Good. So, so essentially, hopefully, we'll be able to give you kind of a wide overview of uh, everything that's uh, net zero carbon and whole life carbon. So, um, in terms of a brief agenda, so we're, we're thinking of first giving you an overview of um, Hilsa Moran and what we do as a practice, so that you can understand the perspective of ourselves as, a, as an organisation. Um, then we kind of go on to um, what is driving net zero in the UK. Um, uh, and, and the reasons why we're doing what we're doing. And then I'll hand over to Mirko to discuss the definition of whole life carbon. And uh, I'll, I'll just touch on um, briefly on the implications of operational carbon on the whole life approach. Uh, and then obviously the main purpose of this CPD uh, and mainly it aligns with um, what uh, kind of you advocate as part of the um, Chartered Institute of Architectural Technologists is the uh, um, is talking about um, knowing about the embodied carbon, the implications of whole life carbon considerations on the REBA plan of work and the circular economy. And I'll leave that into uh, Mirko's capable hands. And finally, I will have a bit of time for any any questions that um, that you may have. So just starting off uh, very briefly on Hilsa Moran, um, we've been in the industry for 40 years. Uh, we uh, primarily started off as mechanical and electrical engineers, just designing pipes, ducts and wires. Um, and uh, over the years, we have evolved into a leading multidisciplinary engineering consultants, um, uh, leading the uh, kind of design agenda in, 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 in the built environment. So together with our sister company, uh, Adam Calatella 2, AKT2, the structural engineers, uh, we're part of the larger, a larger Swedish consultancy called Turens Group. Um, and uh, with the net zero carbon agenda in particular, uh, all industry sectors uh, more than ever need a focus on inter integrated design approach. So all this incorporates various um, engineering services um, from fire engineering, building services, sustainability, smart buildings to, um, to uh, provide a holistic design approach to, to anything we go through. So, so that is where we are in terms of, uh, you know, an organization. Uh, we are present in many sectors um uh basically most the most kind of co um, commercial offices education and uh, hotel sports and leisure but also kind of larger master planning uh, services as well so in terms of the main drivers in the uk so we all know that um the uh you know the, we all know the global urgency in relation to to climate change um as a result the government has recently declared uh, climate change emergency, as we know, set a target for uh, carbon emissions in the UK to be reduced to net zero by 2050. So generally, these policies kind of and targets, they trickle down from um, global policy to European policy to UK policy down to the industry and the general public. However, 
uh, we've seen large businesses and local authorities believe that 2050 is not is not soon enough. And achieving that zero in the built environment has become, as we know, a race a race against the clock. And the industry has has uh, needs to respond, and, and indeed has. So, so we, we, we've we've seen kind of this market drive more than anything else, more than more than um, a, a government push for net zero. So we've seen large cities, um, and a case in point is Manchester pushing for net zero carbon buildings from 2028, for example. And this is to drive the new carbon neutral agenda on in 2038. We've we've also seen. Uh, professionals and businesses declare climate change emergency, taking concrete steps to reduce their own carbon footprint, as well as um, pushing the net zero carbon agenda in, in their respective uh, in their respective disciplines. And also, thankfully, uh, we've also seen the likes of the UK Green Building Council, um, Letty, and essentially organisations that unite industry professionals to drive guidance throughout. So it's not just, you know, the talk, it's actually coming up with concrete guidance on, on, on what it means for us designers to, to push this, this agenda. So, um, another case in point is, is, is London, particularly addressing, um, you know, real depth considerations on embodied carbon guidance and assessment. Um, together with all other frameworks, which we've, we've also been involved in um, as part of our input, and Mirko maybe might talk about later in terms of our input into, into whole life carbon consultations. Uh, and then not to mention the um, additional um, uh, voluntary, voluntary schemes such as, such as BRIAM and, uh, and uh, HQM, which, which kind of drive, drive that agenda. So, yeah, I'll just hang over to Mirko to talk about whole life. Colin. Yes, hello, Th thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to introduce about, uh, uh, you know, all life carbon, and particularly the concept of uh, all life net zero carbon. Um, uh, um, next slide, please. Right. Um, so this, this is, ah, okay. So, um, so this is a, um, this is a figure from um, uh, the Letty uh, Embodied Carbon uh, pr Primer, uh, which was uh, issued last year. And uh, I think it's a very good representation of, uh, um, well, how to define all life carbon and particularly how to define uh, all life net zero carbon. Um, so last year I was involved in Letty leading the um, um, the embodied carbon primer. And uh, so this basically was uh, um, the diagram which was put together by, uh, you know, all the people involved, uh, um, uh, well, in, in producing these publications. And particularly, um, what, what, is, what is clear here is that the, the, the concept of uh, all life carbon uh, includes the operational carbon plus the embodied carbon. Now, uh, if, you, if you look at the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, right hand side, uh, uh, it is about uh, uh, embodied carbon, whereas the, um, um, the left hand side, it is uh, about uh, operational carbon. Now, if uh, both uh, of the emissions are in a way neutralized, in this case, we could achieve uh, the concept of net zero carbon. Um, so uh, I think it, what it came out from the embodied carbon side is that uh, in order to achieve uh, the uh, all life net zero carbon, what it is fundamental, it is to incorporate into uh, all the strategies, uh, circular economy uh, principles, because uh, of course those ones will be uh, will, will help uh, a lot in order in order to achieve uh, uh, you know all life carbon, all life net zero carbon. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, so it, it, I mean, in order in order to obviously uh, achieve uh, uh, um, all life net zero carbon, what uh, we are going to address is the uh, embodied carbon uh, emissions. Uh, uh, which basically are normally emitted by, um, um, by, for example, in this case, procuring, transporting, and manufacturing of uh, material, uh, 
uh, through obviously construction activities and uh, of course uh, uh, during the the use of the building obviously there are uh, of course uh, uh, you know embodied carbon emission due to replacement of building elements and particularly in this phase obviously it happens uh, you know all the operational carbon uh, emissions um, and of course, uh, uh, all of these emissions takes into consideration end of life as well, meaning demolitions or deconstruction of buildings. I think what is very, uh, what, what is very interesting, uh, particularly considering the last two years, is uh, um, if you look at the bottom part of the slide, is the, um, it, it basically gives a, um, you know, a kind of um, snapshot of what uh, the UK GBC uh, published in April 2019, which is the net uh, uh, zero carbon building framework. Uh, there is another slide. So perhaps uh, if we go to uh, the next slide now, right. Um, I'd like to share with you this slide because uh, it is, uh, let's say the, uh, it, it is pretty fundamental to understand uh, how to report uh, uh, all life carbon, because normally in the industry, what uh, it is used for uh, reporting uh, this emission, it is a standard which is called EN uh, 15978. Uh, normally, uh, this standard subdivide all the emissions into uh, stages, as you can see here. And uh, the, the stages basically goes from uh, procuring and producing material to construction, to use uh, of buildings, and uh, of course, to uh, end of life of building. Um, if you see the bottom part, uh, you can see that uh, operational carbon is included as well. Of course, operational water uh, is included as well. And uh, on the right hand side, uh, that there are additional information to be taken into consideration, which are more related to uh, circular economy principles. Now, at the moment, um, this kind of information are not uh, mandatory uh, or demanded by this uh, um, standard, but uh, the way, um, I mean, the way the industry is moving, uh, of course, this will become much more important and uh, uh, the analysis and the report of this kind of uh, emissions will be uh, for sure uh, very important and to be analyzed in the future. Next slide, please. Right, so this is about uh, the UK net zero carbon buildings framework I, was, uh, I mentioned before. And uh, um, I think, uh, well, this was published in April 2019, and uh, I think it was a, a great step forward because uh, um, it provides basically a, a, a guidelines in order to prepare a net zero carbon uh, for buildings. And of course, uh, it takes into consideration emissions coming from, uh, let's say, embodied emissions and uh, emission from operational emissions, uh, operational energy emissions. In this case, uh, if we consider um, uh, the emissions regarding embodied carbon, it is, they are basically only emissions up to practical completions. But I have to say that at the moment, uh, the UK GBC is developing, uh, you know, the all life carbon, um, uh, documents and for sure uh, it will be published perhaps uh, uh, perhaps in next year or the uh, end of this year. Um, I think it, it is pretty important this because uh, um, we we are basically involved uh, in a few schemes uh, and uh, I think what uh, uh, I think what uh, is interesting for myself is that. Uh, uh, the industry is taking this framework in order to basically deal for with uh, you know net zero carbon strategy obviously uh, next slide please okay i'm back all right so no thanks for that Mirko. so um i thought I, I kind of wanted to touch upon the relevance of the operational aspect module essentially that sits in the whole life uh, uh carb carbon approach that Mirko uh, just just mentioned and, and and discuss um what 
um, approach we need to take and what design implications uh, we've seen um, to, to achieve net zero. So, um, <clears throat> so we have seen that uh, operational carbon can contribute significantly to a significant portion of of whole life carbon of, of any building. And, and, and the graph on the left shows an example of that, showing the proportion of the operation carbon. This is specific to an office building over a six year life, life cycle. So we can see you know, nearly, nearly three fourths of, of, of the life carbon associated with operational carbon. But so, I mean, with, with the decarbonization of the grid, with stringent energy and carbon targets, we're seeing that embodied carbon is starting to occupy a larger chunk of that bigger pie. So, so it's, um, it's basically to show that, that, that where the importance is in terms of addressing operational carbon. And, and the part of that, we need to understand where the energy signature comes from with the, gra with the graph on, on, on the right is, is, um, is essentially, um, unfortunately, um, most of the, the current building regulations only addresses the regulated loads. Uh, so the colored loads at, at the bottom of that graph, which, which, which address just heating, cooling, lighting, uh, but it forgets the unregulated loads associated with, with, with equipment and, and um, small power loads. And, and over the past, obviously, 15 years, we've seen the regulated loads being driven down pretty significantly, which is, which is good news. But now um, uh, we cannot forget about uh, the remainder of the um, equipment loads which needs to be addressed uh, to, to, uh, to, to drive operational carbon to as low as possible. So essentially, what is the magnitude of the improvement that we need to do to achieve net zero? So uh, Mirko mentioned the UK uh, Green Building Council's targets and um, um, looking at kind of the, uh, the building stock and where, where, where we're, we're going in, in the future, um, uh, the UK GBC have set concrete um, um, ver verifiable metrics of, of energy that need to be that need to be uh, met to to achieve this this net zero carbon targets and 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 that just shows you the extent of the reductions that we're talking about. This is particular for for offices, um, but likewise uh, there are going to be targets for for all all um, all other buildings to to, uh, to to achieve to achieve net zero. So it's all well and good to achieve these targets at, at design stage. But these need to be translated to um, in an in, in use performance, which matches the, the design intent. So um, there are other other schemes. You've got the Better Buildings Partnership and 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 the Neighbour Scheme, which which specifically address this performance gap. I won't go into any detail on that um, uh, today, but it is it is good to keep those two in mind because we're seeing the industry push towards towards driving down that, that performance gap. So, so how do you achieve net zero? Um, so in, in principle, um, specifically for new build, we have seen that uh, passive design is absolutely key to drive down the dem demand of, of energy and carbon in, in, in a cost-effective way. And that is through um, uh, you know, optimized facade design, uh, driving natural ventilation as much as possible in most building building uses. So once that demand is lowered, to all all, this, all services must be uh, designed in which are as, as efficient as possible in, in operation through through efficient plant essentially. And the technology is going in that direction where where significant improvement is is, is being being done. And that leads me on to the next. Um, point is the importance of the source of energy for those systems. And, and, and this is where the elimination of fossil fuel, um, eliminating fossil fuels are, are critical to, uh, to achieve net zero. Um, and, um, and also moving to uh, an, an all electric solution, which is in line with the decarbonization plans of, of, of the grid. And that cannot be done without smart controls, uh, which is critical to ensure that the, the, the systems are being used um, in the way that they're meant to uh, and, and, and avoid wastage. And then finally, any residual carbon, um, which cannot be met on site. Um, there are various offset schemes um, that are uh, available to, 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 um, to, to target the, the remaining of the carbon. 
that are fundamental in, in that process at this point. So this kind of leads on to our approach as, as designers. What does this mean in terms of our designs? Uh, so unfortunately, we've seen, we've seen this chart before. Um, so one of the, the things we've learned over the past year is the impact of large increases in demand over a short period of time. And, and this demand can result in, you know, it can be anything. It could be cooling demand, heating, power. It can also apply to sharp spikes or dips in, in, in particular temperature. So in, in engineering, we always design for the, for the worst case. I mean, there are legitimate reasons for this, but we need to change that mentality and design um, features which are intrinsically um, them to squash the, the, the sombrero. Uh, and this would result in, 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 in many benefits. It will address the carbon agenda. It will reduce capital costs. It will reduce plant requirements, which in itself is a, has an embodied carbon cost. Um, so, so this is fundamental in, in our design procedure. So, I mean, a typical example on how this can be done is, 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 is through our servicing strategies, you know, looking at temperature profiles in the UK throughout the year. Do we need cooling all the year round? Uh, do we need heating all the year round? Um, can't we utilize uh, resources that are, 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 are available? And this is a typical example. Again, it, it, it is of a, uh, of an office building, but um, uh, there are the mid seasons in spring and autumn where you can use natural ventilation as much as possible, cutting the use of of any mechanical plant and only utilizing cooling when it's only necessary in those peak days in those peak um, temperatures and squash that sombrero essentially using nighttime ventilation, high thermal mass on the building uh, as, as much as possible while, while um, um, looking into uh, 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 solar control measures. So these are just uh, just an example of what can be done to uh, to, to, to address the carbon agenda uh, going forward, and and as well, obviously, adapting to uh, climate change scenarios. So it it is going back to basics, essentially. You know, it's not just uh, um, it's going back to first principles of of design and and designing in features that are not over designed, essentially. So. How does what does this mean for us for des in designers? Essentially, it's, it's and we've seen it in in the case study that Mirko will be mentioning later on, is 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 finding the the sweet spot in in our design solution. So, and and the way to do that is 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 using you know digital digital tools to and, and that's a key to inform this design. There are so many variables in place when altering design features like facade, like glazing percentages, shading arrangements. And those can have effects on heating and cooling, but as well as as, as lighting. And and if you move, you, uh, it's critical to find the optimum solution for all those parameters uh, going forward. And, and the only way we can do that quickly is is to use digital tools in a way that uh, we can inform all designers um, uh, going going forward. And then finally. Uh, is, is, is also from an operation point of view and from an engineering perspective, the other principles that, um, that we have been designing um, into our projects is, uh, are, can be summarized in, in three. The first is, 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 is the importance of um, uh, all electric, which I've mentioned before, and, and it's, it's critical to, to go forward for, as part of the decarbonization of the grid. Um, its uh, energy storage is, is becoming uh, prominent in terms of uh, not only thermal storage, but also um, uh, not only battery storage, but also thermal storage, uh, which allows for kind of smaller plant, as I mentioned earlier. And one thing is uh, the way we move around energy throughout, throughout um, a, a system. So um, especially in, in mixed, mixed use schemes um, where certain areas are predominantly heated while others are predominantly cooled, it's important to have uh, an energy neutral solution, design solution to, to move that heat around and not waste or cr create um, energy uh, when it's not when it's not uh, necessary. And the beauty of these, these approaches in, in, in tandem with all you know, the five uh, fifth generation heat networks and all is, is that uh, anyone can plug and play into, into, these, into these systems. So essentially uh, the 
you know, we, we've worked on a number of projects where we've incorporated all these all these features, such as one Broadgate. It is a pioneer project for the Better Building Partnership, where we're doing it, um, uh, intensive uh, energy modelling to ensure that uh, we achieve low energy uh, use intensities throughout the scheme. But anyway, that's it from me, really, from an operation point of view. And I'll just hand over to Mirko to finish off on the on the embodied and uh, whole life carbon considerations and case studies. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Okay, so I think, uh, um, I mean, what, what is very important in order to address, uh, you know, successful embodied carbon reduction uh, strategies and opportunities is that uh, um, yes. it is very important right. to have uh, an early involvement um, in the project, uh, particularly, uh, I would recommend to be uh, to try to think about how to reduce embodied carbon, let's say at uh, stage two, at least, uh, I would say stage three could be fine. But, uh, you know, of course, at stage two, uh, you know, a lot of things could be done and, of course, refine in stage three. Um, I think uh, what it is very important from my personal experience is that uh, if the project is going through uh, even early stages, uh, and particularly through stage one, and uh, of course, if uh, there is a kind of client brief uh, that defines uh, all the goals and aspiration, I think this uh, basically could help much more in terms of um, addressing embodied carbon. Of course, you can see that, uh, um, you know, taking into consideration circular economy principle should basically start from obviously the beginning. And of course, uh, uh, it should go through uh, both design stages and the construction stage as well. And of course, uh, you know, doing the use of building. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so if you if you would like to have uh, some indication or you know guidelines to follow, and what to do uh, throughout uh, you know all the riba stages, um, th th this I mean this is an extract from the Letty Embodied Carbon Primer, and uh, of course it is a publication which is available uh, for free and it could be downloaded by everybody. And uh, so, you know, I would strongly recommend you to, uh, to download the uh, embodied carbon primer. And you can see here a few uh, indication in order to basically uh, prepare uh, a, uh, an embodied carbon reduction strategy with uh, a great success. Um, next slide, please. Right, so this is, uh, let's say, a typical uh, interaction which um, it is normally carried out during uh, the design stage. Uh, particularly, uh, in order to prepare a successful uh, embodied carbon reduction strategy, what it should be uh, done is uh, a continuous communication uh, between the, um, you know, the LCA and material uh, specialist with the design team. Because of course, uh, you know, through uh, a lot of iteration, it would be possible to uh, analyze and uh, choose, let's say the lowest embodied carbon solutions. Um, as you can see here, um, it could, well, this kind of analysis could be done by a beam model as well. Uh, of course, one of the limitation of using a beam model is that uh, in early stages, perhaps uh, the beam model will not be so uh, accurate. And perhaps, you know, in early stages, uh, well, this kind of approach could not be um, so successful, but of course, you know, uh, a beam model is always a, a source, a good source of information. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Okay, so now we are talking about the uh, circular economy. Next slide. And I think, uh, I think what's happening at the moment in the industry is that uh, there is a transition between uh, what is called now linear economy to what it is uh, partially and is going to be for sure in the future, uh, which is called the circular economy. 
Um, next slide, please. Um, so what uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, now, there are a few circular economy uh, concepts and particularly here, um, you know, before I introduce the fact that uh, it is essential to consider a circular economy principle in order to achieve uh, uh, all life net zero carbon. And uh, particularly on, on the bottom uh, right of this slide uh, is a, uh, an extract from the Letty uh, embodied carbon primer. And uh, of course, you know, it gives uh, uh, a kind of high level indication of how to address circular economy. Now, all of these, um, um, yeah, all of these uh, aspects were basically uh, refined through, uh, let's say, a year of work and uh, particularly, uh, well, they, they I mean, uh, they consider, um, you know, the findings also coming from uh, a research project, which is called the BAMB or Building as Material Banks. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, of course, all of these principles were used in order to, um, you know, define the basis for a circular economy principle to be implemented into the uh, all life net zero carbon. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we were talking about uh, linear economy, and uh, so this is a kind of uh, breakdown of what uh, it is, uh, uh, the current uh, uh, linear economy. Uh, so in other words, what's happening is that uh, normally, the, I mean, material resources are extracted, uh, they are used for producing uh, building elements in this case, uh, they are used and, that, and then they are wasted. Most of the time it could be disposed, uh, well, most of the time are recycled, but uh, uh, yeah, next, next slide, please. Right, so, I mean, in other words, what's uh, um, the circular economy principle is that uh, um, it is essential to keep, uh, you know, the, the material flow uh, as much as possible uh, into uh, the building. And this is possible to be done through a few um, principles. For example, uh, you can see that, uh, uh, you know, repair, reuse, uh, uh, and uh, uh, remanufacture and recycle could be um, a very good aspect well, a very good uh, uh, way to address uh, circular economy. Of course, what it is interesting is that, uh, uh, of course, uh, if you reuse something as a, a higher uh, impact in terms of, uh, um, you know, um, preserving uh, the raw material and of course, uh, um, you know, addressing, um, you know, all life carbon. And um, of course, uh, I mean, by applying all of these principles, what is visible is that uh, the uh, natural resource extraction are uh, reducing and of course, waste uh, is reducing as well. Uh, next slide, please. This could be a kind of future uh, scenario of what uh, the industry is, is going. And, uh, you know, of course, you can see that uh, the uh, resource extraction are minimizing and, of course, that the waste is minimizing as well. I mean, hopefully in the, in the future, uh, there, that there will not be uh, uh, any waste at all. And that would be, of course, the ideal situation. I mean, in order to do so, what uh, it is very important from my experience is that uh, um, you, you can see that uh, under the production, uh, there are two other aspects, which is leasing and servitization. Uh, I think those two are uh, two emerging uh, aspects and uh, particularly leasing and servitization. It is uh, a new way to, um, uh, let's say building a building because uh, at the moment, uh, let's say uh, a building, it is built using products and uh, and that's it whereas uh, um, i mean by by leasing or using servitization of uh, let's say building products or uh, any other kind of elements which is going through a building um, it is of course providing a a great uh, uh, impact because uh, uh, i mean in other words uh, uh, 
the transition between linear and uh, um, circular is that, uh, let's say, true, I mean, when you, uh, when you use a product, obviously you buy a product and, uh, and then you become the owner of the product. Whereas if you go through a leasing or a servitization, you don't buy anymore a product, but you become a user of the product because uh, the products uh, are owned by uh, the companies which provide these products, obviously. And uh, I mean, of course, uh, they are more efficient in terms of uh, um, lasting. And of course, uh, there is no, uh, well, perhaps, uh, the impact in producing waste, uh, of course, will be minimized. Uh, next slide, please. So now we are going through a few case studies. Uh, yeah, next slides. Um, th this is a <clears throat> this is an example of uh, uh, optioneering, uh, and uh, I think uh, it is very important to do this kind of exercise because. Uh, because of course uh, it is possible to understand which kind of options could be used uh, for delivering the same uh, function. In this case, obviously it is a, a flow uh, types uh, analysis, which was basically carried out in order to uh, understand which floor could be better in terms of embodied carbon. And, uh, you know, of course, in this case, uh, this kind of exercise are very good to understanding uh, what uh, um, uh, what uh, uh, flow types would be less carbon intensive, uh, and of course, uh, you know, in parallel with it, what it would be very useful is to have a, a cost analysis as well. Uh, so, in other words, uh, you know, if cost analysis and embodied carbon analysis will match, that would be obviously the uh, the perfect. Uh, uh, flow type in this case. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is a kind of, um, this is a, an, another similar um, uh, analysis, uh, particularly this is only for insulation. And uh, so the, the case study here uh, shows a, a case study of uh, um, only insulation. Uh, which is going to be uh, for building a, a wall build up or pro for providing a 0 0.25 uh, uh, U value. Now you can see that uh, uh, you know for providing this kind of U values uh, by using a different kind of uh, insulation types, it is possible to achieve different kind of uh, embodied carbon emissions. Um, now if you of course, uh, it is visible that in order to achieve the, the U value, uh, you can see that, uh, uh, of course, the embodied carbon change, but the thickness of the uh, insulation uh, varies as well. Now, this is a very important aspect because uh, it depends on obviously what uh, you are targeting. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, if you want to achieve uh, a lowest uh, embodied carbon impact, of course, in this case, I would go for the rock wood, which is on the left hand side, on the right hand side, sorry. Um, but uh, of course, uh, you know, as you can see, this is more or less the, um, it is, is, it would be a very thick insulation. And of course, this will penalize uh, perhaps uh, the, uh, the floor area. And of course, if your goal is to achieve as much uh, as possible flow area, in this case, I would go for, uh, for example, phenolic form, because uh, it is, uh, uh, let's say, the good pro compromise for achieving a low embodied carbon and perhaps to maximize the flow area. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Um, so this is a, a project we've been involved uh, uh, with uh, Rob Foster as well from AEW, uh, and uh, I think uh, I think uh, this was a, a very interesting project because uh, uh, Cooperative was. Uh, uh, very keen on to basically design a building which would be uh, highly uh, sustainable. Now, Cooperative uh, wanted to, um, to follow the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, 
And particularly in this case, uh, they wanted to uh, score uh, a very good results in uh, the goal 13 for climate actions. Of course, uh, th this project addressed uh, a lot of other uh, goals, uh, for example, uh, the number 12, uh, or uh, for example, the number nine as well. Um, and of course, others as well, uh, indirectly. Um, so, I mean, in this case, uh, what the cooperative wanted to prepare was uh, uh, a, um, a building which was possible to be uh, demounted at the end of life uh, using uh, the building which was built uh, originally. Now, the process uh, started by taking into consideration a, uh, an existing building, which is on the, uh, right, uh, the left hand side. Uh, which was the cooperative uh, building in Shabington. And from that, uh, um, that, that, that building basically was developed the, the green store. Now, the green store was uh, designed to, uh, to follow cradle to cradle uh, design principle. And of course, you know, uh, circular economy principle as well. I mean, in other words, what it would be possible to be done was uh, to um, to try to address the way to uh, make uh, the, uh, the building as much efficient as possible in terms of embodied carbon emission at upfront. And also uh, to, I mean, the, we, we basically went through a lot of conversation with the design team and uh, uh, the final goal was obviously to design something which was possible to be demounted at the end of life. And uh, of course, uh, um, at the end of life that uh, the building uh, could be possible to be demounted and to be rebuilt uh, uh, again in a different place. Um, in this case, what uh, uh, the study was uh, taking into consideration was that the building um, uh, was going to be demounted and remounted in another location, uh, which was uh, one kilometer far away. I mean, of course, this was a, a kind of exercise we went through in order to prepare uh, a development uh, guidance. And, uh, you know, of course, on the uh, right hand side, you could see that uh, it was possible to achieve 56% uh, 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 carbon reduction, uh, considering obviously the embodied carbon emissions and the um, operational emission as well. Of course, uh, uh, it would be po it, it was possible to achieve this kind of um, reduction because uh, uh, the green store too was uh, supposed to be built uh, using a lot of parts coming from uh, the green store one. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Right, so uh, of course, uh, in order to um, apply cradle to cradle design principle, uh, what uh, it was fundamental to be done was to basically uh, create a demanding and reduced strategy. Now, the demanding and reduced strategy was uh, basically uh, explored by um, the full design team, particularly uh, architects, uh, structural engineer, and uh, mechanical engineer as well. And uh, uh, of course, uh, what uh, we tried to do in designing this building was that uh, um, we, we tried to maximize uh, as much as possible the demountability uh, possibility uh, at the end of life of, of every uh, green store. And uh, of course, you, you know, you can see here, which is an extract from the AEW, uh, the montability strategy. And of course, you know, you can see that, uh, for example, the top material, which is uh, the insulation, was meant to be demanded, well, was meant to be possible to be demanded 100%, whereas uh, the yellow uh, insulation um, below, it was, it was possible to be demanded, for example, 70% of the, the quantity. Now, 
you know, of course, uh, uh, if you consider the 100% possibility of the mounting for uh, the top insulation, this means that uh, in building the next building, which is the Green Store 2, um, there was not, uh, uh, it was not taken into consideration any, um, um, any procuring of new material because uh, the insulation was possible to be demounted 100%. Uh, and of course, this basically provided a great improvement in order to reduce the embodied carbon and all life carbon of uh, um, the green, uh, green store number two. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, that's it because uh, next, I think this is the last slide. Uh, so, you know, I mean, thanks very much. And uh, uh, of course, feel free to ask uh, any question because I think now there is uh, the question and answer session. Thank you, uh, Mirko and David, uh, fantastic as always. Um, I'm just gonna very quickly run through um, the questions that people have asked. And um, if you two could respond, that'd be amazing. Um, so one from Paul Bull. Um, it was mentioned that all electric was essential uh, to achieve net zero. Uh, do you see any benefit in hydrogen infrastructure? I am unsure. Uh, David, can you? Yeah. Would you like yeah. to? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think I think hydrogen has definitely um, a, a place to uh, to fit in, in in the overall 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 strategy. Um, the we we know that there are there are um, there are studies going on to see whether they can use the existing gas infrastructure to uh, supply uh, hydrogen through across across uh, across that infrastructure um, which can be used for for essentially providing heat for the, um, uh, domestic properties so i think that is fundamental going forward obviously in terms of the larger schemes it gets a bit more challenging when it gets to um, um, uh, the storage of hydrogen. So, so, so I think each individual case will need to be addressed uh, addressed in its in it's, it's in it's in in its own in its own merits. Um, but uh, certainly, I think the hydrogen will first kick in more on the larger scale production and production of of uh, of energy, and then and then that will uh, trickle down to to a more wider used replacement of natural gas in the infrastructure. Thank you, David, for responding to that. Um, next question um, from uh, Besky. Um, hello, is there a tool to analyze net zero carbon in buildings? So I suppose the question is what typically do Hilsa Moran use other than your, your, um, um, your knowledge? Yes, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so I, I mean, yeah, definitely there is a, a, so let's say there are tools to assess net zero carbon. Um, so let's say at the moment, perhaps uh, I would say the best way to address net zero carbon is to assess separately embodied and uh, uh, operational. And of course, uh, uh, the way would be to combine the, the results uh, and uh, of course, to see if it's possible to achieve net zero carbon. Um, I mean, if the question is if there is a tool, a, a one tool, perhaps uh, at the moment, I would say no, but I would say, well, for sure there are tools, but uh, from my point of view, if you want to do something accurate, you should assess separately, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, next question from uh, Dale. Um, what resources do you use for finding embodied carbon in products and materials during the A1 to A3 stage? Yes. Um, well, so um, it depends on obviously where uh, the design the design process is. Uh, what I would suggest is that uh, if the project it is in early stages, I would use uh, um, you know general data from, uh, for example, uh, you know LCA tools, uh, which basically uh, provide let's say average data from the industry. Um, if the project is already in a, let's say, developed um, phase, for example, stage 
three or stage four, obviously, uh, what it would be recommendable would be to use uh, environmental product declarations. Um, now, you could use the environmental product declaration as well in uh, at the beginning, uh, let's say stage two as well. But uh, uh, I mean, environmental product declaration normally they are the majority of them they are product specific. So um, you know, of course, if you consider a product specific at the beginning, obviously. Uh, the embodied carbon emission, it is pretty um, precise. So in order to keep that kind of embodied carbon values, obviously you have to be sure that, uh, you know, the product will be used even for building because otherwise uh, there could be um, uh, an increase. Yeah, I, I remember from um, working with the, working with your songs on the co-op project that when I was researching materials, um, finding the EPDs was a struggle with some suppliers to begin with. Yes. And then to find an EPD that would go beyond stage A1 to 3, yes. um, yeah. later into sort of the more sort of circular elements. So they're, they are out there. It's just you need to do a, a, a fair chunk of research um, yes. in yes. order to find them. Um, and what you could say is that is that um, the industry is responding to that. So, so uh, you know, um, there's a big drive now for all manufacturers to provide EPDs on on their on all their products, and even for in terms of building services systems. Uh, you know, where previously it wasn't even talked about, uh, now it, it is being considered quite quite widely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Moving on to a, another quick question. Um, recommendations for a recent architectural technology graduate um, on where to find more information regarding designing for net zero buildings. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd signpost the work that the UK GBC are doing. Um, do you chaps have any other recommendations as to where they'd go to find further information? Um, I think uh, I think good good information are also uh, available in the Letty website as well because uh, uh, I mean the guidance are very from my point of view they are very good. Um, well, perhaps you know the UK GBC as well they are very good guidance as well. Um, you know in terms of uh, embodied circular economy and. Uh, operational as well. Uh, do, do you have anything you would like to suggest, uh, David? Um, no, I think I think the UK GBC um, already went through, and Letty went through quite a bit of uh, consolidation of information. So it's definitely the first port of, port of call. Uh, then you can go through uh, various um, organizations like the Chartered Institute of Business Services Engineers, uh, obviously, um, Reba and, and they've, they've got their own guidances. That that is a good starting point for for net zero. If there's something in particular that that you are after, uh, any particular topic, feel free to get in touch with us, and I'm sure we'll be able to direct you to the to the, to the best best place. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to try and very quickly skate through these. I know we're we're we're, we're going to slightly run over. Um, so, uh, question from Nick Jones. Um, uh, as the industry, uh, as an industry. Um, how is all this going to be achieved at the lower end of the building sector, i.e. Uh, domestic housing, especially repairs and refurbs within that yeah. sector? Especially yeah. for part of the industry that hasn't really adopted them in some cases. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a very, very good question. Um, uh, unfortunately, the way we see it and it being in the industry is that the, um, yeah, the, the, the existing domestic uh, market is, is always at the, at, the, at the tail end of of, of any new legislation process or, or trend, unfortunately. I mean, obviously in terms of the way we are approaching it at the moment, and there's a big focus on the um, net zero carbon in new builds, because obviously they have the biggest implication when as compared to existing buildings where you're re reusing materials uh, in, in, in effect. So, so um, uh, I, I, I I, I don't see that happening any any time any time soon. But I would imagine that what we see in, in terms of, for example, the EPC legislation and energy performance certification, 
for operational carbon. In the coming years, maybe decades, I would imagine that being drawn out to um, to include uh, you know the effect of, of of embodied carbon as well going forward as a metric to show the sustainability and energy carbon credentials of 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 any building. Thank you, David. Um... Just for Luke's information, Abigail has kindly signposted a few events from Letty and a few other um, articles for you to uh, refer to. Um, isn't that nice? A bit of a community feel there. <laughs> Everyone helping each other out. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're going to very quickly skim through some of these. Um, so question from uh, Simon Wilshaw regarding the co-op case study, um, where the construction costs um, of the amountability and reconstruction compared against the cost of rebuilding to the same design in a new location. Um, it loves the idea, but it seems very labor intensive. Um, from my own 10 penneth, I can't, I can't remember whether we actually, whether that was actually considered or whether that was compared by the, uh, by Henry Riley, the QS is on the scheme. Can you remember David? Um, it was, no, it was definitely one of the metrics that, um, cause it was all quite confidential when it came to the cost side of things. Mm. Um, but in the, in the grand scheme of things, um, I believe it, it was cost, cost, uh, close to clock cost neutral, um, over, over the life cycle, life cycle. So, so I, I don't know at practical completion, obviously there was a, a certain element of, of, uh, or a capital cost increase that was required as part of part of obviously the net zero carbon approach. And um, however, when you account for the life cycle of the building, the demountability of, of the materials, there was uh, it was uh, cost neutral if not if not um, um, uh, cheaper in the long run to 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 uh, to build a building of that of that uh, stature. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, if, if I can add something, um, well. Perhaps uh, the way to demount a building instead of to demolish, uh, it is perhaps uh, uh, more, car well, let's say more intensive in terms of perhaps money. But if you consider the fact that if a building, it is possible to be demounted at 80% and uh, to be remounted in a different location, I mean, the second, well, the green store too basically comes uh, already with a massive saving because uh, you don't have to procure any more, uh, you know, building elements because you, you have already, uh, you can source obviously for the green store one. And also I think a, a very important aspect is that, uh, uh, is the social aspects of uh, the mounting versus, uh, you know, demolishing. Because, uh, you know, of course, more people can work uh, on um, this process. And of course, this is a kind of in, an indirect uh, benefit, obviously. Okay. Um, apologies that I've not got to everyone's question. Um, I'm just going to pick out one or two of the last ones. Um, there's uh, one from Susan um, on the, uh, the floor and body carbon reduction chart you showed using a steel uh, CLT combination. Uh, did you also look at uh, glue lamp CLT flooring solutions and would this make more of a positive difference? Um, well, I, I guess you are, you, you are referring to the optioneering of floors, I believe. Um, so, I mean, of course, that was uh, an example. Uh, so, you know, in normal practice, obviously, uh, you know, every kind of options will be considered. And of course, uh, they will be considered depending upon, um, you know, the project requirements. So yes, for sure, you know, if uh, if the glue lamp would be uh, uh, a potential option, yes, of course, uh, it will be taken into consideration. Cool. Um, okay, last two, I promise. Um, Shannon, um, what's everyone thinking in the high embodied energy but high thermal mass materials versus low embodied energy but low thermal mass materials debate? What's 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 the thoughts on this, David? Or Mirko, one of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, from from my experience, um, there there hasn't been there hasn't been um, it, it's never. 
set, set in stone in the sense that it's very subject to, to the building uh, in question and depending on, on the loads. Um, so, so, for example, in, a, in an office building, we, we see that a high thermal mass material uh, or kind of hybrid solution is, is the best option because you are predominantly in an office, you, you're cooling and, um, you know, with mixed mode, with the high thermal mass, nighttime ventilation will, uh, over the um, life cycle and operational carbon side of things, it, it will provide a benefit. But on, in a school, it might have a different, different, uh, uh, different story to, 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 to tell. So uh, yeah, it, that's a, we can have a debate on that. So it's a kind of a whole session on it on its own, uh, but it's uh, it's one that uh, yeah, th there's no answer, direct answer to that, unfortunately. I think I think uh, yeah, I, I agree with you because there is no no no, uh, no answer. But uh, I mean, what what is good to be done is to basically carry out uh, a few iteration by assessing you know different solutions, and of course uh, you know. Of course, uh, after carried out a few iterations, you can find out which uh, solution would be the less carbon intensive, obviously. Um, I, I mean, of course, I'm talking about uh, uh, the consideration in parallel of operational and embodied. Thank you, Mirko. Um, last but not least, uh, James, um, how would it be possible to get net zero carbon in healthcare buildings? which are traditionally high energy using users with life support systems. Uh, yeah, um, uh, unfortunately we, do, we don't have direct, direct, I mean, that is one of those sectors that we're not, we're not uh, involved in healthcare, but um, uh, and again, I think it, it, it's, it's um, that subject to, you know, I think offsetting needs to needs to play a part in that in terms of uh, um, in terms of assessing the buildings where you know things are are, are critical, uh, for, for, are fundamental for, for their purpose, which cannot be cannot be uh, uh, bypassed in a sense. So uh, so yeah, I think it, it's all about uh, the importance of smart control and adopting smart smart uh, means to to reduce. The, the high energy demands and in use going forward. And I think that is critical with, with, with healthcare buildings is, 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 is trying to, to, to manage that uh, energy use as much as possible. Well answered, David. Um, I just want to say from everyone on the call, uh, thank you to both David and Mirko for uh, presenting a fantastic presentation and um, sharing your uh, afternoon with us. Um, thank you for everyone who attended. Um, I think Colin, we're closing the show today. We are, and, and thanks. Uh, I, I reiterate the thanks Rob expressed, and thank you, Rob, for organising this as well. It's okay. Um, just you. in case anyone wants to refer back to this, um, this will.